Listen, we're going to begin a new study today that I'm, I'm calling Emmanuel, and this is interpreted God with us. That verse, when Jesus was born and that his name would be called Emmanuel, is recorded in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 23, and we'll, we'll be spending more time talking about that. But I want to go back to something we just read here in Galatians 4, and we'll look at it down in verse number 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. That meant the plan of God sending his son predated the birth of his son. We see God, you know, in his seat uh, in eternity, where he can see past, present, and future all at the same time, is declaring that Jesus came in the fullness of the time. That there was a time that was appointed by God in which he would send forth his son. And the reason why that is so important is that I don't want anybody thinking that Jesus' beginning was Bethlehem or that Je or Jesus' origin was necessarily conception in the womb of the virgin named Mary. But Jesus goes all the way back into eternity past. The plan of God to send forth his son has always existed and there's something beautiful in that revelation when you begin to see it because it, it, it represents the integrity of God's word that he would call something forward before it ever was and that's his plan for our salvation. So Galatians 4 says, in the fullness of the time, at the, full, at the right time, God knew exactly when he would send forth his son and he had planned that he would send forth his son made of a woman and made under the law and that he would come to redeem us. This story really begins in Genesis. So if you would turn back over there to Genesis chapter number three, I, I want to talk about this fullness of the time, fullness of the time. God sent forth his son. He knew when he would send forth his son. And what's so amazing is God's patience. Because I don't know if any of us can touch, you know, the, the word patience and be pleasant about it. We don't like being patient, but God is extremely patient. And he was certainly patient when it came to the sending forth of his son. Because I'm going to show you in the word here that from the time he announced that Jesus was coming, he would wait 4,000 years before he actually sent forth his son into the earth. I'm hoping today that every one of us get a revelation of Jesus, perhaps in a way we've never seen him before, that we see the heart of God and the plan of God that has been disclosed and made known ever since man sinned against God from the beginning. God began to disclose this plan where he would wrap himself in flesh, come into this earth and die for our sins. Nothing that happened at the nativity, nothing that happened in that stable, nothing that happened in Bethlehem was just a coincidence that history records. It was all foreordained in the mind of God, and I want to show you the beauty of it. That way, when you sit down any time of year, and especially at Christmas, you can preach the nativity, and people get a revelation of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Amen? So that's what we want to unpack. That's what we want to unfold so that we can truly celebrate Christ. So in Genesis chapter number 3, God had made man and given him a wife, and given them a commandment. And that commandment recorded in the second chapter was that there was a tree called the knowledge of good and evil that man was not to eat of. And if he were to eat of that tree, then there would be the penalty of death. And we know that the serpent, according to verse 1, came and he tempted and beguiled the woman to eat of the tree. She gave also unto her husband, according to verse 6, and he did eat. Both of them had sinned against God. And look what sin did in verse 8, Genesis 3. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Let's read that part out loud together. Ready? Read. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I can see God at the beginning of the day, at the cool of the day, walking with Adam. 
teaching Adam, whatever you put first will control everything else in your life. How many of us are putting God first in the cool of the day, at the beginning of the day, before the day gets intense, I put him first. God is walking with man in the cool of the day because that's why God created man. And it cannot be said enough that God didn't create man for a religion. God created man for a relationship. And there is a distinct difference between a religion and a relationship. And I'm not the advocate of religion. I'm the advocate of relationship. Religion is all about how man can get to God. But Christianity is all about how God came to man. Emmanuel, God in man, God came to me because he knew I couldn't get to him. But that story, that story that, 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 that encompasses the gospel, that story that, that we, we read about that, in, in that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, it didn't begin in Matthew. It didn't begin in Mark, Luke, or John. No, we go all the way back to the beginning and we first see God's heart to save man right after man needed that salvation when he had sinned against God. Verse 8 reveals the heart of God, and I hope today you capture that, is that he's choosing to commune with man, to walk with man, to speak to man, and that's his heart for you and me. That's never changed. You know, when, when God made man, it is recorded in Psalms 8 that there was an angel that was in awe of what God had done. And in verse 4 of Psalms 8, this angel testified and said, What is man? What is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that you visit him? What is man that you would leave your, 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 the glory of heaven and, 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 and meet with this man and walk with him and commune with him? Do you realize that, that God's not waiting for you to come to church to meet with you, but he will meet with you anywhere, any place? place at any time. He, he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He desires to have communion with us always. That is his heart. And the intention of God's heart to have fellowship with man moved even one of his angels. I believe I know which one, but that's another sermon on another day, to say, what is Man, who is this man? Think about parents, if you have a teenage boy and you're growing up and all of a sudden, you know, he's spending all the time on the phone or all his time over, you know, uh, running, running someone. You say, wait, wait, where have you been? And you find out he got his eyes on somebody and you got to ask the question, who is so-and-so that they're blowing your phone up? And who is so-and-so that you're always over their house? Well, there was an angel that saw the heart of God toward man and it prompted that angel to say, what is is man what is man that you're so mindful of him what is man that you visit him that's the love that God has for man that's the love that God has for you and me that's the intent of his heart to have a relationship to have a relationship church should not be about a religion church should be about a relationship a relationship and we got to recognize that Jesus came to restore what had been broken Religion was not what was broken in the beginning. The relationship is what was broken in the beginning. Because when man sinned against God, what did he do? He hid. Verse 8 said he hid. And Adam and his wife did what? Read it. Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Sin formed a wedge. Sin forms wedges. The book of Proverbs says that the wicked flee when none pursue, which means when I feel guilty, I run, even if no one is pursuing me. That means if someone asks you a question that's related to something you know you've done wrong, you jump into defense mode, and they don't even know what you're talking about. Why? Because the wicked flee when none pursue. God was not chasing Adam down to punish him, but yet even before the Lord showed up to meet with him, Adam was already hiding. Why? Because of that sin consciousness, the guilt and the shame of what he had done had driven him away from God. And that's exactly what the Bible says in the New Testament in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's a verse many people are familiar with. All have sinned. But know the rest of that verse and come short of the glory. 
What is the glory of God? What is the glory of God? Lord willing, we'll talk about it in this series. But the glory of God is the revelation of God. It's the disclosure of God. It's the intimacy of God. It's when he reveals to us who he is. When we begin to get a revelation of, man, God is good. Oh, man, God is merciful. Oh, God is gracious. Oh, God is truth and God is love. When you, be when you begin to receive that revelation of who he is, that's called his glory. The, the Hebrew word is the kabod. It's, it's the revelation of God. But what keeps me from that revelation when I'm not in his presence? Somebody asked me years ago, and they might have had some deep intent, and I never got there. But they asked me years ago, why did I think God or Jesus when he was raised from the dead? Why Mary was the first one to see him raised from the dead? Why Mary? And I, my only answer was she was there. She showed up at the tomb that Sunday morning, and, 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 and he, he was risen. You, you say, but why, man? Because she was there. You can't get a revelation of what you're, you're not in front of. You can't get a revelation of God when you're not in his word. You can't get a revelation of God if you're spending all your time in something that don't have anything to do with God. And so God's glory is the revelation of who he is. And Adam and Eve are hiding themselves because of sin. They are driven from the presence of God. But what does God do in verse 9? Because what God is going to do starting in verse 9 is what we find threaded throughout all of Scripture. 4,000 years of old covenant promise and prophecy all take us to this plan that unfolded when Emmanuel, Jesus, came into the earth. But Jesus didn't just show up. And there's not just a record of Jesus having showed up. The record actually started before he showed up. God, from Genesis all the way to Malachi, took 39 books in the Old Testament to begin to describe the one that would come. As a matter of fact, there's not one, two, or three prophecies about the coming of Jesus. There are a total of 330. 330 different descriptions of who Jesus would be and what he would do. 29 of them fulfilled in one day, recorded in the 22nd Psalm, speaking of his crucifixion, down to the details in verse 16 where it says his hands and his feet would be pierced. Every detail of Jesus from his birth all the way to his death foretold. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 told us he would be born in Bethlehem. My point is is that everything that we celebrate, everything that we celebrate at Christmas and that we talk about in these scriptures we read in Hallmark cards, all of that foretold. And that is the beauty of the Word of God is to see that, that Jesus didn't just show up and then there was a record. No, the record was recorded before he came. <laughs> That's beautiful right there. And isn't it interesting that God would take 39 books in the Old Testament to speak of the coming of his son? Because when you recognize um, the architecture of God's Word and just his method in his word, and you see his uh, uh, wisdom even in, in numbers that again and again we find this pattern in God's word that 40 represents something being fulfilled, something being tested and fulfilled. The, the, the flood of the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. Moses in Egypt, 40, day, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years, 40 years leading the children of Israel to the land of promise, the temple, 40 years in the making. And I could go on and on and on. And then you look at the Old Testament and you see 39 books and you think, man, God, did you miss one? Is there a missing book of the Bible? Why are there only 39 books in the Old Testament? Because the Old Testament did not introduce Emmanuel. The Old Testament didn't bring us the birth. Therefore, God couldn't put 40 books in the Old Testament prophecy because it had not been fulfilled. But but when Jesus shows up in the New Testament, now we have the fulfillment of what God has said. And that's what Galatians 4.4 4 is meaning when it says, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son. That meant from the very beginning when man sinned, God already knew in his mind's eye exactly when he would bring forth his Savior. And 2,000 plus years after the fact, we're still celebrating. What you say? So the Lord, watch verse number 9. I want you to see his heart. And the Lord God called unto Adam in his sin. See, your sin won't stop God from talking to you. Ain't that good, Brother Jefferson? That's good right there. I'm glad he taught me when I was a sinner. I wouldn't have got saved. He said unto Adam, where art thou? 
God doesn't ever ask a question he don't know the answer to. He asked the question to make us do in a self-examination. He was letting Adam know, look at where you are. Look at what you've allowed sin to do. Sin took you out of my presence. Sin has broken the relationship. You used to walk with me every day, and now you're hiding. I think all of us can relate to that at some point in our life. Adam said, well, I was afraid, and I hid myself. But he was never afraid until he sinned. Sin had formed a wedge between Adam and God, between Adam and Eve and God. But it's not changing, oh, this is so important. It's not changing the heart of God. It's not changing the heart of God. When we read the 23rd Psalm and we see, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, that's translated in Hebrew. Literally, I could say it in English like this. Goodness and mercy are in hot pursuit of me. In hot pursuit of me. God is not just behind me. He's chasing after me with a relentless love that at some point his goodness goodness and mercy might lead me to repent and I'll see what's been with me all the while. That is a God that is intentional and that is aggressive and passionate about you. Hallelujah. And it's first revealed when man had sinned. Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? I miss your presence. What have you allowed to come between us? And Adam says, well, I, I was naked and ashamed, and I, I got to get these fig leaves sewed together, and, and I got to get some things worked out. And when I get all this worked out, you know I'm going to come back. And how many people today are out of the will of God trying to work it out? I'm going to get some things worked out, Lord, and I'm going to be back. No, he's saying, come back now. You can't work it out without me. You're trying to do without me what you can't do with, without me. You can only do that with me. I'm not intimidated by your mess. I'm not intimidated by your sin. I died for you. I want you. He loves you. Glory be unto God. Romans 5, 8 says, God commended his love toward me, and that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Jesus didn't come to die for the righteous. There were none. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Oh, hallelujah. God's heart for man is revealed right after man sinned. So he's going to call Adam and Eve and the serpent before him. And he's going to pronounce a judgment. But notice within the pronouncement of the judgment, there is a promise. And not just a promise, but a prophecy. God foretelling what he would do. And the setting is the sin of man, the use of the woman, and the work of the enemy. So God brings in the enemy, he brings in man, and he brings in the woman, and he's got them all right in front of him, and he lets all three of them know what the sentence will be and what the future will hold. And he tells the enemy something we need to pay attention to. So he speaks to the serpent in verse 14, and he goes on to say in verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. God just announced, there's coming a man-child. There's coming a man-child, a seed. And this man-child's not just going to show up. Man don't go to space without a space suit. And God wasn't going to come into the earth without an earth suit. So he's saying, you use this woman to bring forth sin, but what you don't know is the reason I made a man with a womb and called her womb man was so that I would have an avenue to come into the earth. You thought when I made man that, and made Adam that Adam was the perfect picture of the image of God? No, that was the first Adam. What you don't know is there's coming a last Adam. And that last Adam will be the fulfillment of what I planned for the first Adam. What you say. 1 Corinthians 15 says he is the last Adam. God was looking at Jesus when he made man. And when he created woman, he was creating an avenue in which he would come into the earth through the womb of the woman. So he's telling the serpent here, 4,000 years, 4,000 years before it ever happened, he's saying there's coming a seed and it's going to come through the womb of a woman. And this woman would be untouched by man. Man wouldn't have anything to do with this. This woman would be a virgin. 
And if you know anything about the chromosomes and the makeup of, of, of conception and, and the DNA of a child, that a child's blood type is not determined by its mother, but it is determined by its father. What you say, God determined the blood type of Jesus. You say, was it blood type O? Was it blood type A? It was blood type G. God Almighty, this was the blood of God flowing through Emmanuel's veins. This is God in the earth realm right there conceived in the virgin womb of Mary. But, but, but Mary didn't just get pregnant as a virgin. And then we get a history of it in the Gospels. And then the record be written after the fact, looking back at that moment, celebrating a birthday. No, it was pre-told. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? My mother kept a photo album of all of her kids, and we each all had our own photo album. And we go back and look at the photo album. We see the day we came home. Remember the old Polaroids? You took the picture and the Polaroid came out and you had to wave it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. You had to wait for it to develop. And man, I got a photo album of my, of my childhood and you got the birth right there. My little, my little bald big head and, 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 and my, mama writing on a little Polaroid notes about it. Then you, you look at my life and you go through the photo album and say, oh, Pastor, man, you used to be cute. What happened? <laughs> All of us have a beginning that we can go back and celebrate on a birthday. But man, if my mama had kept a journal, if my mama had kept a journal and from the time that she was old enough to write and say, I'm going to have a son, his name's going to be James, he's going to be born on December the 27th, he'll be born to one Je Jessup Altus McMenus. I mean, if she had written all that before she met my daddy, I'd be like, hey, wait a minute now, my, my, what, who, you been? who am I that you knew me before I came? But don't nobody have that kind of record. None of us have a record of who we were before we were. But there is one that has a record of who he would be before he ever be and his name is Jesus God didn't wait till he was born and then tell the story he told the story before he was born that's powerful and that's what Christians need to understand because it adds integrity to God's word so many believers only see Jesus through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's beautiful, and I'm not taking away from the Gospels, but you cannot appreciate the Gospels until you understand what came before them why did Matthew write that genealogy that we skip in our annual Bible reading? So and so begot, begot, so and so begot, all them big names only he and his mama can pronounce. Why did Matthew write that? And why did he begin his genealogy with Abraham? Because he knew that God had made Abraham a promise in Genesis 17 that a seed was coming out of the loins of Abraham that would be a king. And so Matthew is writing to prove Jesus is the child of Abraham. He is the one to whom the promise was made. But when you get to Mark, it's easier reading. 16 chapters, no genealogy. Why? Because Mark's not writing to prove that Jesus is a king. Mark is writing to prove that Jesus is a servant, that he's a servant. He, he's writing to record what the Spirit says in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. That though Jesus was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Mark's saying he's a servant. By the time you get to Luke, Luke's saying, well, I'm not writing to prove that he's a king and I'm not writing to prove he's a servant. He's going to do such amazing and supernatural things. Some will wonder if he was even a man. And so the physician Luke writes his genealogy. And where does he take Jesus back to? Not David, not Abraham, all the way back to Adam. Why? He's making the case Jesus is the son of Adam because it was to Adam and Eve that the promise came that a seed would come forth. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? But by the time you get to John, Hey, by the time you get to John, hey, John is not writing to prove that Jesus is a king. He's not writing to prove that Jesus is a servant. He's not even writing to prove that Jesus is a man. No, John is here to tell us this Jesus is God. So I'm going to take my genealogy all the way back. And in verse 1 of John 1, he says, in the beginning, in the beginning, not with Adam, not with Abraham, not with David, not with Joseph, not with Mary, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he says, in verse 14 and that word was made flesh Emmanuel and tabernacled among us he's making the case Jesus is God he's Emmanuel God wrapped up in human flesh oh that's beautiful right there 
But watch this, fan, th th this plan unfold, th this plan unfold. So God says in verse 16 of Genesis 3, he said, hey, uh, or 15, there's going to be a seed. And this, this seed's going to crush your head, Satan. In the process, his heel will be bruised. Can you see the nails? See, he's already telling us what it's going to be. Christians, listen to what I'm saying to you. Those that are contemplating becoming a Christian, this is the beauty of the Word of God. There's no book like it. You, you, you can point to other religious people and characters and find books written about them after the fact. And you even find some that they wrote themselves about themselves. But you're not going to find another book that has 330 prophecies speaking of one that would come. And then another record following that proves everything that the first prophecy said would actually come to pass. That's what separates the Bible as the word of the living God. Hallelujah. There's integrity in this word when you start looking for Jesus. You see how beautiful it is that nothing just happened. It was all ordained by God. You can go at Christmas and take the nativity that people have been seeing all their lives, seeing the little uh, uh, figurines that you buy and set on your coffee table or the stuff you put a light bulb in and set out in your yard and use it to preach Jesus. You can look at that nativity in your house at Christmas and say, babies, do y'all see these, these, these shepherds here? Do you know why they were there? No, grandmother, why were they there? They were there because God had sent a lamb. God had sent a lamb. And every lamb that was ever offered for sin had to be raised by the shepherd. It was the shepherds in which you got the lamb. And the lamb that was taken to the priest that was offered before God began with the shepherd. And if God was going to send his son as a lamb to redeem us from our sin, then it would make Makes sense that the shepherds were the first ones to know that the lamb had been born. This boy was not born in a manger. He was not born in a stable because there was no room in the inn. I know the Bible tells me there was no room in the inn, but that's what that's the way man viewed it. Joseph didn't want that boy born in a stall. Mary didn't want to have birth in a, in a stall. But, but God ordained there be no room in the inn. They would have had birth in the inn, but the inn was full. As far as I know, God filled the inn with angels. He changed the lights to say, no vacancy. I don't know, but the Lord was not going to have his baby born at the holiday in Bethlehem. Why? Because his boy was going to be the lamb that would die for our sin. And a lamb's origin is a stable. His origin would be a manger. God was sending a message even through the nativity who his son would be. Hallelujah. No wonder when John saw him in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, when John saw Jesus, he said, Now behold the Lamb. Now behold the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Where do we first see a Lamb? We first see a Lamb here in Genesis 3. We see a Lamb in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 21, when God would offer a Lamb and blood was spilt in the garden. And God would take the skin of that lamb and give Adam and Eve a covering. And they now knew my sin cost the life of the innocent. My sin required the shedding of innocent blood. From the beginning. From the beginning. When God had Jesus to be born in that stall. And Joseph is shoveling manure, thinking, oh, I let God down. I let God down. My job was to take care of Mary, and I got my wife here would have been pregnant with the Son of God, and what can I say to a father that, would allow, that, that, that I would allow him to be born in a stable? It was man that said there was no room in the inn. God always wanted him born in a stable. There may be things that man has said about your life, and you think you're in the wrong spot at the wrong time, but the sovereign hand of God has you right where he wants you right now. Don't be phased by what man says. You thought you didn't get that job because they hired someone else. You didn't get that job because God didn't have a place for you there. He's got a place for you somewhere else. Don't you ever forget the power of the sovereignty of God. He orchestrated his son to be born in that manger because he's the lamb that would take away our sin. And so the first people that got the announcement were the shepherds. The shepherds, first people to get the announcement, an outcast smelly, rejected, out in the field by night. 
And God said, you're going to be the first ones to find out. I'm not going to the major city. No, I'm going to the field. I'm going to the shepherd that, that's watching your flock by night. And since you're the shepherd and he's the lamb, you're going to be the first ones to know. And the angel came out and said, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Say that out loud. Glory to God in the highest. What was he saying? He was saying in all the years that God has revealed his glory, he has never revealed his glory like he's doing right now. Oh, he showed up in a rock and brought water. He showed up in a fire and brought light and warmth. He showed up in a cloud and brought a covering. He showed up in the sky and dropped manna. He showed up as a serpent and gave healing to Israel. He showed up as a staff and parted waters, but he never showed up as himself, wrapped up in flesh. My God, my God, my God, glory to God in the highest. He who says high came low. And the scope of his salvation is unlimited. Let me say that again. The scope of his salvation is unlimited. So the first people to get the announcement that he had come were shepherds and outcasts or rejected cultural people. But you know what? It didn't stop God from putting a star in the sky, aligning the solar system to put forth the greatest light man had ever seen and cause students of Daniel the Magi in the east to see the star and to know the prophecy that the king had been born. Two years in getting there. But what was God saying? Whether it takes me two years to get the rich or to get the poor in one night, I'm after both. God doesn't see anybody in the spectrum of humanity that he doesn't want to save. Whether you live last night under a tree or whether you slept last night in a mansion, the love of God is chasing after you. You don't Escape his love. Oh, hallelujah. So God begins to reveal his plan. And Satan heard it, and he obviously believed it. Because, and Adam and Eve did too, at least Eve. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bare Cain. And said, I'm winded, so y'all read it with me. I have gotten a man from the Lord. Let's read it again. She went to Adam and she said, I got a man from the Lord. What would even make her say that? Because God had already told her there was coming a man child out of her womb that was going to crush the serpent. And so she's expecting this first one is it. So she goes to Adam and she says, well, I've got a man from the Lord. Now, she ain't the only one to believe that. The serpent believed it too. Because 1 John 3, 12 says Satan entered into Cain. Satan entered into Cain. He didn't want Cain to, to be the one to fulfill the prophecy. So he, he beguiled, he deceived, he entered into Cain to thwart this plan. But I hate to tell you this, Eve, that wasn't God's baby. That was Adam's baby. That right there is your first member of the Adam's family. Satan would enter into Cain, and then they had another boy named Abel. And Abel heard about how God had sacrificed a lamb to cover the sin of his mom and daddy. And Abel said, you know what I'm going to be? I'm going to be a shepherd, or what you say. I'm going to be a shepherd. And he shepherded sheep. And when his sheep conceived, he took the first sheep, and he offered it as a blood sacrifice and brought it to God. And God said, wait a minute. This is the first man since me to offer a lamb. Boy, that ought to sit for a minute. God looked at Abel and said, this is the first man besides me to offer a lamb. See, the first lamb was offered by God. In Genesis 3, 21, God offered that lamb for the sin of man. He would offer the first lamb and the last one, Jesus. First always points to the last with God. But Abel was the first man to offer a lamb. Abel and Cain saw it. He said, wait a minute, he's got faith in the blood. Oh, he's been called righteous because of his faith. And what did Cain do, filled with the spirit of the enemy? He murders Abel. The enmity has begun. The, 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 the wicked hating the good. The lost hating the saved. Uh-huh. You need to recognize in this world there's a spiritual warfare going on. 
Well, the wicked hate those that are called of God and bear the name of God. There's some things that generate hatred in your life. They don't have anything to do with your name or your position or what spots you hold on that job. There's a spiritual warfare between the lost and the saved, and we have to understand it and recognize it and have a discernment of it. Jesus said we would be hated in this world for his name's sake. The enmity had begun. The first murder took place. So what's God going to do now? Well, he's going to give Adam and Eve a replacement. A substitute, another, and his name would be Seth. But before I read to you what God would do in Genesis 5, you got to come over to Isaiah chapter 41. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 41. This is going to stir your spirit right here. Isaiah 41. Everything about Jesus foretold. Everything about Jesus foretold. Didn't just happen. It was foretold. Hallelujah. Isaiah prophesied. I want you to go to the 41st chapter, but before you get there, let me quote chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall rest upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All of that spoken, all of that ordained before he was ever born. Isaiah is telling us what's going to happen. Matter of fact, in chapter 7 of Isaiah, chapter 7, I know you're in 41, but I'm giving you other stuff. Chapter 7 of Isaiah, in verse 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? It means in man, God. Glory to God. He's as much God as though he were never man. But as much man as though he were never God. That's powerful. But watch what God does here in Isaiah 41. Verse number four. He says, who hath wrought and done it? Calling the generations from the beginning. Read that statement out loud. Calling the generations from the beginning. See, he says, I don't wait till the generations or genealogy happens and then write about it. I tell you before it happens. I got a cousin that's man. He he studied our family history and knows everything about the family tree. Who climbed up in the tree and who snuck behind the tree? <laughs> if I got any question about my family? I got a cousin that studied ancestry.com and all that stuff. God says, you know what? Anybody can study their history, but I'm going to tell you history before it happens. Verse four, he says, "Who hath?" called generations from the beginning. In other words, I didn't wait till they were born. I told you of their birth before it happened. He says this in verse four. I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. If we were reading that in Hebrew, it would read, I, Yahweh, the Aleph, and with the Tav, Yahweh. Hallelujah. Because that I am is Yahweh, it's the Lord. And what I love about reading that in Hebrew is that we need to understand that anytime you read in the Bible of the first and the last, that's referring to the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph Tav, the Aleph Tav. And if you've not been to an Aleph Tav conference, let me just give you a quick 60 or 120 second uh, uh, cover of the Aleph Tav. There are 22 letters that make up the Hebrew alphabet. The first is the Aleph. It's where we get our letter A. If, and it was depicted in the ancient Hebrew pictograms by the head of an ox. In the original and oldest language known to man, Hebrew, in the ancient Hebrew pictograms, a letter standing alone had its own meaning. And so the Aleph, which was the first letter of the alphabet, was depicted by the head of an ox with two horns. Our A has derived from that, except it's upside down. If you turn the A around, you'll see the head and you'll see the two horns. It's, it, it's the oldest language. All languages derive from Hebrew. And it represents God, strength, and service. But when you come to the last letter in Hebrew, it's a tav or a cross, two sticks laid over each other like a mark on a map, like a destination. And that, that tav represents a mark, a destination, or a covenant. 
So even in the letters that make up words in which we get the word of God, if you just took the first letter and the last letter of the 22 letters in Hebrew, those two alone point to what God was up to, that he had a destination, the top, from the very start, and that God himself would be the strong servant who would serve the purpose of the cross. Everything about Jesus points to the cross. That's why he was born in a stable. That's why the, the shepherds were the first to get the announcement. Everything that God is doing is pointing to redemption, that Jesus would ultimately pay the price for man's sin, and that is the best news you have ever heard in your life right there. And he says here, I, the Aleph Tav, verse 4 of Isaiah 41, I call a generation from the beginning. I will tell you what I'm going to do from the beginning. I don't wait till the end and then tell you what happened. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens and you'll know I'm God. Now, with that in mind, I want to go to Genesis 5. Go back to Genesis. Genesis 5. There's going to be some preaching this Christmas. Glory, glory, glory. Genesis 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. I could say it this way. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam, the stuff we skip in our annual Bible reading. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female. Well, that's all that God made. And that's the way it is today. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day that they were created. And now we get this spot that we start skipping. Adam lived a long time, begot. Then his son begot. And then his son begot. See all them begots? Let me take it down to a begot that you recognize. All right? So we'll go way on down, and we'll find somebody you, you can find. Verse 28, and Lamech lived 108 and two years and begot a son and called his name Noah. There's somebody we recognize. Noah was the tenth son from Adam. Noah was the tenth son from Adam. So God has chosen here to lay out a genealogy of the sons of Adam and he does it through 10 generations. Now, that kind of stuff we tend to skip when we read the Bible, but it's there for a reason. Because when you look at these 10 names beginning with Adam, Abel was righteous, Cain was unrighteous, Cain murdered Abel, Seth became the replacement. So God's lineage would come through Seth. Watch this. When you take the 10 names that God just mentioned, which is the first genealogy in the Bible, the first generation mentioned in the Bible, not Matthew, not, not, not Luke, first ones right here in Genesis 5. And you pair that with what God said in Isaiah 41 verse 4, that I call a generation forward before it happens. That's what God did with Abraham when he came to him in Genesis 17. And when he came to Abraham, and he said, Abraham, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And he started making all these big promises. If you remember, and if you've studied it, Abraham says back to God, why would you do that for me, seeing I have no seed? I have no children. It would end with me. I have no children. See, Abraham was sensitive to the fact that God was calling forth a generation until he had brought forth his son into the earth. And how could Abraham be a part of that equation if he and his wife are 99 years old and can't have children? And God took him outside and showed him the stars of heaven. He said, can you number those stars, Abraham? Abraham said, no, sir, I can't do it. He said, that, that, so shall your seed be. And he prophesied that there would be a seed to come out of the loins of Abraham. And guess what? When you read Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46, after Mary had given birth to, to, and given the announcement of Jesus and had brought Jesus into the earth, when you read her words, beginning in Luke 1, verse 46, she honors God for having kept the promise he made to Abraham in blessing her womb to bring forth Jesus. What does that mean? Mary herself knew that the promise of a son was 4,000 years old, that this thing did not just happen, but it was her that God had used to fulfill something he had said 4,000 years prior. Is that not powerful? 
So I'm going to close. And it is, I'm almost there. But I want you to hear this because this is beautiful. So you got 10 men from Adam, nine after Adam, that were born in the earth. And God is saying, I got, I got it. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. I'm bringing forth the sun. It's coming. He's coming. And enemies rose up and kings rose up and tried to kill the righteous, thinking they might be it. Moses' salvation, he became a type of Christ when he was put in that basket and sent down the river because the enemy has always been after the seed. He hates the womb of the woman. He hates the idea of the seed that might come out of that woman. He's panicking because he knows that was the avenue that God would bring forth the Savior. And so God, to make sure everybody knew what he was up to, he gives us 10 generations. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and then Noah. But when you take those 10 men's names, we're going to show it to you. When you take those 10 men's names, Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enosh means mortal, Kenan means sorrow, Mahalel means the blessed God. Jared names means shall come down. Enoch's name means teaching. Methuselah's name means his death shall bring. Lamech means despairing. And Noah means comfort and rest. When you take those 10 names of the first genealogy in the Bible and then you translate their meaning into a statement, this is what it says. Man was appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. God was sending the God gospel through the first genealogy in the Bible. He is sending a message that I have salvation coming and it's coming through a genealogy. It's coming through a seed and that's what we celebrate at Christmas and every other day of the year. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nothing like the Bible because you can't read another book that tells of one's coming before he actually came. But God's word does. It's easy to write a book about yourself. Read it about yourself before you get here. My son asked me earlier when he left the second service, he said, Daddy, I thought Jesus was from Nazareth. Why was he born in Bethlehem? I said, because Micah chapter 5 verse 2 said he would be born in Bethlehem. I said, he was raised in Nazareth. The only reason they were in Bethlehem was because of the census that God ordained to get Mary where she needed to be to fulfill the prophecy. You see what I'm saying to you? All this stuff man thinks he's in control of. God said, no, I'm working that. You thought you did that? That was me behind the scene. I made that happen. Because had I not done that right there, this thing would have landed like I said it would. Every detail about Jesus foretold before it ever happened, that can only mean one thing. He is who he says he is. He is who the word of God says he is. And church, that ought to give every one of us a reason to celebrate Jesus and to accept this gift that God has given us. I want to I wanna pray for you and I want to pray with you this morning in closing. Let's go to the Father in prayer and with every head bowed. I just want to ask you a simple question. I want to ask you a simple question. Who is Christ to you? Have you received him? Do you know him? Where is he at in your life right now? Because it doesn't matter what last night looked like or last week looked like. You're not here. You're not watching this live stream or telecast by accident. God's calling you not into a religion. He's calling every one of us into a relationship. And that's why he sent his son. His blood will cover your sin. His spirit will give you new life. His word will give you the wisdom to start making the right decisions. His will for you is good. He loves you. I know the enemy will tell us things like, oh, God could never love me after all this. Oh, yes, he can. Jesus didn't come to die for the righteous. There weren't any. Is he saying to you, Adam, where are you? Have you been walking with him in the cool of the day at the beginning of each day? I'm not saying these things to condemn because I bear the same judgment. We just need to be reminded. We were created for relationship. We were created for prayer, for worship. This world has us so busy, 
so busy that we don't make time. I see it week after week after week, and in a moment like this where I'm praying, I have, you know, I don't even, my eyes are closed, I can't see it, but I know it, I've seen it before, people just get up and leave. In a moment of prayer, we don't have time. It's, a, it's not that we don't have it, we don't make it. Go into this season, go into a new year to make time for a relationship that your father wants to have with you. You're trying to, we're trying to do things on our own that we can't do without him. And he'll get all in your life, every detail. He's not just looking at the big stuff. The Bible says the hairs on our head are numbered. That's how aware he is of you. The word says he knows my uprising and he knows my downsitting. That's how aware of, of, of he is to you. He's an intentional God. I know we're a week away from gift exchanges. What's supposed to be a season of celebration. God's gift wasn't put under a tree. It was hung on a tree. And there's so much good God wants to do for you. In Isaiah's day, an honorable or wealthy man would go into a marketplace. His son owning and having everything he could want. And on his son's birthday, he would go to the marketers and say, whoever comes to your booth and uses the name of my son, I'll pay for their goods. And as the day would evolve and more and more people got their stuff given for free in the name of a honorable man's son when they would see the son walk through the street they would applaud because they got their gifts in his name whose birthday have you ever celebrated well the one to whom you celebrate doesn't get the gift don't give a gift without honoring Jesus that's year around not just Christmas Father, I pray that your church would rise up and that you would use us to bring your son glory, to make him known in every season. And over these next few days and Christmas and New Year's, draw us closer and use us to minister to family and friends and loved ones to tell the story to our children, to point at a simple nativity and tell them Jesus. Not reindeer and snowmen, Jesus. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I've seen in your word your pursuit of man and a relationship from the very fall of man that before I ever sinned you had a plan to save me and to restore me to have a relationship with you I receive what you did for me through your son Jesus and I ask forgiveness of my sins that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness And that you would remove from my life, from my heart, my memory, what separates me from you. That my relationship with you, my Father, would be restored. That you would fill me with your spirit and use my life to bring glory to your Son, to advance your kingdom. That I would know my purpose And see the fulfillment of a life in tune with you, in harmony with you. I want to walk with you in the cool of the day 
putting you first in my life. So whatever has kept me out of fellowship, give me a conviction. Remove it from me and restore me. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.